Uh, we have with us today Mr. Uh, Wickle, who's the special assistant to the ambassador at the U.S. Embassy, who's going to speak to us today on some problems in communication. Mr. Wickle. Good afternoon. Uh, may I sit down like you were all sitting down? <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, I don't think I could stand for a whole hour. <laughs> Uh, that was a very, very uh, broad introduction, some problems in communication. Communication uh, is a very broad field, and uh, of course, it always involves problems. This is what brings about communication. I think if you study the need of human beings to communicate one with another, if you go back to the earliest man, the most primitive society, you'd find out that he, the primitive man probably would have been able to do without communicating with anybody, except that he had problems that had to be solved. Questions of how would he eat? How would he find a mate? How would he take care of whatever offspring resulted from that union? How would he teach his children to survive in a hostile environment? Communication the need for communication probably arose from these very pragmatic necessities. Uh, as I start, I'm reminded that uh, communication uh, can take place between two people who share the same language, the same culture, the same values, in which case it's perhaps a little bit easier than communication between people who speak different languages and have different values and different cultures. Uh, the reason I'm thinking of this is that uh, for a long period of time in the Department of State, a very small number of us who served as interpreters also had the uh, responsibility of training other interpreters. <laughs> In my case, this meant that I would uh, work primarily with Japanese-English combination interpreters. Mostly it was Japanese uh, men who were hired uh, by the Japan Productivity Center to work in the United States on the productivity program. But some of my colleagues, my friends, the French interpreters, the Spanish interpreters, the Chinese interpreters, worked primarily with people from their area. There was one time, however, when we had three young Japanese men to be trained in interpreting techniques, and I had to go away on a trip. So one of my colleagues, a Spanish interpreter, took over that part of the training that I normally conducted, which was giving a series of lectures on life in the United States, the value system. Now, I'm sure that you all have met Latin Americans. Uh, you probably know that the people who live uh, in Brazil, in Argentina, in Spain are very emotional people. They respond very actively to almost anything. They're constantly in motion. Um, you've probably all seen flamenco dancing, haven't you? Have you all seen a flamenco dance? Is there anyone here who's never seen a flamenco dance? Well, you know what I mean. There's this violent activity. Well, this is a type of thing that represents the culture of the Latin American, the Spanish and Portuguese speakers. Now, the Japanese, if you've all gone to a no play or a kabuki play, you can compare and contrast the kabuki dance with a flamenco dance. And you can see the differences in reaction. Uh, well, my friend, the uh, Spanish interpreter, began his uh, discussions with his three young Japanese interpreter trainees, and he had a great deal of difficulty because they never reacted to anything he said. Uh, many of you have just laughed at one thing I said when I talked about comparing kabuki and flamenco. I think you understood the point I was trying to make. <laughs> And I did get a reaction for which I'm very grateful. But my colleague years ago in 
working with these three young men in a classroom situation, found that they were very earnest, very diligent. They read every book he recommended in one night. They were prepared to ask very serious questions. And they were very, very well indoctrinated. They were very well motivated to do the job they had been chosen to do. Uh, there were perhaps 20 young Japanese men from a population of 100 million who were selected because of their ability to go to the United States and work with the top management teams that came from Japan, and they took their responsibilities very seriously. So they were very serious in their lectures. My colleague from a Latin American country could not understand that. He said when I came back that he had tried for three weeks to tell jokes, to try to make things interesting, but he just couldn't understand why those three young men sat there every day in the lectures and never smiled and never laughed. So you can see that people from different cultures have different attitudes, and sometimes this becomes a part of the communications pattern. Uh, rather than go directly uh, into problems in communicating across cultural barriers, though, it might be interesting to talk about communication in general among people who share the same language and the same values. Uh, we've all, in our lives, gone through a very simple process. We didn't know what it was at the time. Later on, perhaps in school, we found out that the sociologists and the psychologists and the anthropologists, everybody, just everybody, was very interested in studying how children learn how to speak their own mother tongue, how children absorb from their parents, from their teachers, from their playmates, from the entire world surrounding them, how they absorb from this the ability to speak. You take a baby, a baby is very, very helpless. A baby doesn't have a great deal of ability to communicate, except when he wakes up hungry, he can cry. And when she wakes up and has to have her diapers changed, she can cry. But beyond that, there's very little. And yet, within just a few short years, this small organism, this small creature, this bit of human life, begins to absorb all sorts of words and combinations of words to make its desires and its needs known to its parents. Uh, we've all gone through that. Perhaps we don't recall how we went through it, but there are a number of scholars and researchers who attempt to determine how language is taught to young people, to children, to infants, and how values are transmitted. This is perhaps the first time we ever have any contact with uh, communication in the large sense, that is how we relate to other people. As we go on then to school, uh, almost instinctively, it's a little bit like learning how to swim. Uh, if you wait until somebody is big and try to teach him how to swim, it becomes very difficult. But if you take a two or three year old uh, child and start at that point, they learn how to swim almost as easily as a fish learns how to swim. There's, you don't have to teach anything. They do it instinctively. But, uh, it's in this manner, then, that we begin to acquire patterns of communication, which probably stay with us for life. There are certain ways of thinking, certain ways of evaluating situations, certain ways of expressing ourselves that we learn at that stage that stay with us for life. Later on, of course, as we get older, we go on and learn second languages or third languages or fourth languages, or if you're a real genius, maybe six, seven, or eight languages. In your case, I think probably English is your second language. There may be some of you who also have studied some other language. English might be your third. But nevertheless, you're now going through this process as young adults learning a second language. You don't have the advantage of being a two-year-old or a three-year-old in the home with mama all day, uh, surrounded by certain things, and you don't have the advantage of learning this language without some pain, 
without some difficulty. Uh, maybe we should all learn three or four languages when we're children. But at any rate, you're now going through this stage as young adults to acquire a second language. Now, Mr. Saku and uh, your other sensei have told me that there's a wide variety of ability that some members of the class will understand everything, including a colloquial joke. Some people might not understand the jokes, but they would understand everything of a serious nature. Uh, and I'm not sure myself looking out i can't tell which of you speak english well which of you are just starting out i hope that if i talk too fast if i say things that you don't quite grasp immediately or if i just don't make sense because i'm not making sense that it doesn't discourage you uh, we're all we have one experience in common that is having learned a second language later on in life as young adults. Uh, years ago, I struggled through the same process you're going through now in English, only I was studying Japanese. So in one sense, maybe we've looked at this barrier from different sides and uh, at different times in our lives, but I think I can sympathize with your attempt to learn a second language. Uh, I recognize that it's very difficult to master all of the patterns English, of course, is not a language like Japanese, which is spoken with a certain amount of homogeneity by a homogeneous population. Uh, there are some variations I know very well in Japan, in dialects and in intonation, etc., from Kyushu to, to Tohoku. But then when you consider the variations in English, Japanese doesn't have that much variation. Uh, if you try to speak English to an Australian or to a Welshman or a Canadian or an American from different parts of the United States, uh, to a Malaysian, to a Nigerian, uh, or to any number of people who use English as a common language in a multicultural country or use English as a common second language, uh, you'll find that there's a tremendous variety in speed, in tempo, in rhythm, in accent, in stress, and also probably in terms of the value system that underlie the use of the language. The, there are Anglo-Saxons who use English, but there are non-Anglo-Saxons who also use English as a native language. In East Africa and Kenya, for example, English is the common mother language, the only common language among the various tribes that live in that country. Yet it's not the native language. Those people are hardly what you would call Anglo-Saxons, but they speak English. In some ways, then, uh, you find in Ghana, also in Africa, that people speak English. It is one of their mother tongues but they speak it somewhat differently. They speak it in different interesting rhythms. The people of India, for example, India is a state which has Lord knows how many different native languages, but is held together by this one, one of two common languages in uh, English. Without English, many Indians wouldn't be able to communicate, I'm told. And uh, if you've met Indians, you know that they speak also with a different kind of a rhythm. Uh, naturally, the things they say are based on a totally different value system. Their judgments are based on different standards. So that uh, English is not one single language spoken in the same way by all of the people around the world who speak English. I'm sure by now you all know that. In some cases, I have my own doubts that it's spoken by, in the same way, by all of the people within a single country. If you look at the Irish, who live on that one little island, and see how the people in North Ireland are unable to communicate, if not intelligently, at least without violence, with the people who live on the other end of the island, you may have some doubts that communication really is such a good thing after all. Uh, you get the 
religious factor, the Catholics versus the Protestants, their a common language is really uh, something that seems to keep the people apart. Maybe if they spoke different languages and were not able to talk to each other, they would not have such a great problem in Ireland as they seem to have at the present time. But I think you can see the point I'm making that uh, a common language, English, uh, well, it may be a common language, a mother tongue in some countries, uh, nevertheless is uh, really a whole set of associated languages. It's as though, uh, well, you probably do find in Japan that uh, the people in Okinawa speak Japanese in one way, the people in Kyushu have their various dialects, the people in the Tohoku and other areas have different dialects. But they seem to have a cultural homogeneity. Uh, there is a certain uh, sharing of views, a certain, a certain sharing of ideals, motivations uh, common to just about all of the Japanese who speak Japanese as we know it. If you find then that in a I won't even have to talk too much about the French. The French concede that nobody can speak French like they can, and they can they accuse each other of being unable to speak it properly. Uh, if you ever want to have a reception or a cocktail party, which will be full of verbal pyrotechnics, if you want to have a lot of scintillating intellectual debate, or if you want to just have a lot of argumentation, uh, invite two Frenchmen and get them to discuss the French language. I guarantee that it's impossible for them to agree. Uh, the French Academy argues sometimes for years before they can agree to accept a new word into the dictionary, before they can officially recognize it. Two or three generations of Frenchmen may have been using a particular word the people who initially used it may long since be dead, but the gentlemen of the French Academy still debate whether it is a pure French word or not. And if it is impure, then it should not be permitted into the French dictionary. But we don't even have to consider the French then in these terms. Here in Japan, uh, we have a totally different situation with respect to uh, borrowed words. Uh, one of the things 30 years ago that struck some of us in studying Japanese was that there was a small number of foreign words incorporated into everyday Japanese. You know, pan, zubon, all that. There were a few words like that. But now in the last 10, 15, 20 years, and currently, uh, we find that there is a veritable flood of foreign words into, into everyday Japanese. It may be that advertising, it may be that television, it may be that the mass communications media have brought this about. But nevertheless, uh, if you watch television for one evening, I think you could probably come up with a catalog of three or four hundred foreign words being used either in the dramatic shows or in the commercials, particularly in the commercials. It seems that on television, if you want to sell goods, if you want to sell candy bars or automobiles or gasoline or something, that every other word in your commercial message uh, has to be uh, a foreign word, an English word. And uh, it makes it, uh, well, Japanese has become quite a different language from the Japanese that we studied uh, in the class uh, devoted, you know, to Kanban or something like that. Uh, now you can hear, if you don't know the word in Japanese, you can always use the English word. Uh, some of my friends have advised me, and chances are it is well understood. The, in terms of communication, then, uh, the Japanese language changes rapidly in time. This is a fact that uh, can be cited with respect to just about any language in the world. Uh, in some cases, it took this process took place over a longer period of time. These days, of course, with the rapid growth of technology and improvements in communication, 
these changes are telescoped in time. What formerly might have taken a whole lifetime will now take place within one year. Uh, at the time of the Meiji Restoration, I don't know how long it took to cross the Pacific by ship, but it certainly couldn't have been uh, anywhere near the time it now requires to place a Trans-Pacific telephone call. Uh, changes in technology affecting communication. I can remember in uh, 1948, I think it was, I was here in Japan. There was a heavyweight championship fight being uh, fought in the United States. I suppose you're all too young to remember Joe Lewis or Joe Walcott, but these two old uh, fellows, they weren't so old in those days. They were fighting for the heavyweight championship and uh, here in Japan, we were just barely able to pick up a shortwave radio broadcast describing that fight. This was not more than 20, 25 years ago. A couple of months ago, how many of you saw the uh, fight on television when Joe Fraser and uh, Muhammad Ali Cassius Clay were fighting? Did many of you see that fight? Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, you see, in just a brief span, I was a young man for the first fight, now I'm middle-aged for the second. When you're young for this fight, uh, the thing was on satellite and it was carried here in Japan on television. Just was a one hour delay, I think, in broadcast. But we saw it here almost the same time it was taking place in New York. That's a tremendous quantum leap in communications, a tremendous uh, rapid growth of the ability to communicate over vast distances. And it's this sort of thing, I think, that breaks down many of the barriers to communication. One of the prime barriers of communication is not even understanding what the other fellow is talking about, not just not knowing his language. Maybe you don't know his language, but also you don't know what his purpose is, what his values are, what his ideals are. It's common human trait, I guess, that if you don't know the other fellow, if you've never seen one before, you assume that it's hostile. If you're walking around in the great prairies of, um, oh, Central Asia, or if you're in the jungles of Africa and you see something that you've never seen before, and it's got four long legs and long claws and big teeth, well, you just assume that it's hostile. And you get into this tribal habit of thinking that everything that looks different from you is hostile. It's very easy for people to get into this habit. Uh, it just occurred naturally, and it's taken many, many thousands and thousands of years to try to get rid of this uh, feeling. But nevertheless, uh, without communication, when you encounter something you don't know, uh, there's always an assumption that this might be dangerous for you. You might react in a different manner than you would if you knew the other party. So uh, I suppose a great deal of this increased uh, technology that permits more rapid communication is all for the good. Uh, just as, uh, oh, in terms of Japanese history, uh, at the time of the Meiji Restoration, the unification of the country, the implementation of a common educational system, the Imperial Rescript on Education, the, the insistence on a national standard language rather than a whole series of dialects, all of this had the effect of bringing the Japanese closer together as one nation, one people. I don't hint that television via satellite communications will do the same for a world community, at least not maybe for two or three or four hundred years, but uh, it could, properly used, go far to eliminate a great deal of the various kinds of barriers we now find to communication. Uh, when you're with people, you, I think you have a tendency to grow to like them. You meet common challenges, you learn to rely and trust, you rely on and trust each other, and uh, there grows then a certain common respect one for the other, which is very healthy. Uh, perhaps some of this rapid technology and communications will help spread this sort of effect. I guess we can only hope so. Uh, perhaps uh, since you're studying English here, uh, 
you might be motivated. Uh, you might have the ambition of serving abroad for a company or a bank or with the government or as a journalist or a research scholar. Certainly you're not taking this time out in the middle of a busy afternoon to study English simply as a time-killing pastime. If you were simply interested in that, you might be out at the Kodak Lynn or someplace watching a baseball game. It would be less difficult than listening to a long talk like this. So I would only assume that uh, you're motivated seriously uh, to use English as a tool for communication in your work or in your research. Uh, uh, I would uh, certainly hope that uh, whatever your ambitions are in this area, whatever your dreams are, that you would be able to realize them uh, at some point, not too far off in the future. Uh, if indeed this is your purpose and you go to live abroad uh, in one of the English-speaking areas, it might be Hong Kong. Uh, they speak English in Hong Kong. Uh, it might be Canada. It might be Ghana. It might be uh, Ireland. Or it might be North America, Canada, the United States, whatever. Um, you'll find that... Uh, during the day, uh, you'll be using English in a variety of ways. In a passive sense, you'll be listening to a great deal of English. If you do uh, what I do, for example, when you get up in the morning, you might turn on a radio or a TV, probably a TV set, and in the morning you begin to listen to all sorts of informational programs, the news, the weather report for the day. Uh, Weather reports are easy. You know, they put a chart up that either it's got an umbrella and you know it's going to rain or they have a picture of the sun and you know that you won't have to take your umbrella that day. You start out a day acquiring information about your immediate environment. You start out the day by listening to newscasters tell you what happened in the world yesterday and overnight. And this is pretty much straight expository English. Somebody is trying to tell a story. If we all sit down and try to describe what happened in a baseball game, the chances are we might all write pretty much the same sort of a description. There are only so many ways you can say that a batter struck out or somebody hit a home run. When you get into the straight exposition of facts and you're acquiring news, in a passive sense, watching a television program. Uh, this sort of expository English is not too difficult to grasp. Then you might go and sit down at the breakfast table and pick up the morning paper. And in addition to reading the news of what did occur, you might come across the editorial page where you get into another kind of use of language. After all, it's on the editorial page that the wise men who run the newspaper uh, sit down and uh, share their wisdom with you by relating what happened yesterday and last week to what might happen next week and tomorrow, and they recommend certain courses of action to you. Here you'd find that the language is tied to a value system, whether it is political or economic or sociological or ethical or religious or what have you. In order to write editorials, you have to have a point of view. And you begin to encounter there the use of language, which is somewhat different uh, from the use of language on the straight news pages. Uh, and then after breakfast, you go down to the office and you begin to use English and uh, encounter English of a totally different variety. Uh, whatever your business is, you might be working for Sony and uh, be interested in servicing Sony television sets, or you might be selling something, it might be a tangible like a, an automobile or a watch, or it might be in the services area, you might be working in a bank, you might be doing something related to financing, to insurance, Lord knows, you might even be working for the embassy in Washington, doing something in the area of diplomacy. But in any 
is that you would then begin to use English in a totally different way. You would have to use it yourself to make your way in the world. Whether you're selling a product or a service, you would have to use English of a kind that would be very persuasive and convince someone else that whatever it was you were recommending to him is something he should do. This is another kind of use of language. You might uh, become a professional debater, and you'd find that you would be using language in oral argument uh, in a totally different way. You might be involved, say, in a, a legal proceeding of some kind, without necessarily qualifying for the bar, without being a lawyer. You might nevertheless get yourself involved in situations where you're arguing the merits of certain cases. Who's right? Who's wrong? Why is he r right? Why is he wrong? Uh, here again, you'd be using language in a totally different way. All of these things would also be true right here in your own country. Uh, as you move through the day, you're encountering, you're engaging in the practice of communication, either actively or passively by providing or receiving information from one or many others uh, in much the same way you would be doing this abroad. Uh, it would become slightly different if the language changed. Uh, the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, there are, uh, you have to uh, consider then the uh, various cultural factors that go into the makeup of the individual you're dealing with. Uh, primarily, uh, I suppose, you could start out and say that uh, all societies are shaped in one way or another by a religious heritage, a religious tradition. If we were to talk in terms of the communication angle, we would say perhaps that uh, Japan is a country that's been shaped by two broad traditions, the Shinto and the Buddhist tradition. We'd probably generalize and say that uh, in the case of the United States, which is one country where English is spoken, it's been largely shaped by the religions of the uh, Mediterranean and the, uh, the Near Eastern desert regions, that is the so-called Judeo-Christian religions. Uh, you might find that there's a tendency for people who have been raised in the uh, Western Judeo-Christian religions to think in either-or terms. Uh, you say yes or no, black or white. Uh, there's no in-between, no maybe, no gradation. Everything is posed in terms of absolutes. Uh, you can see this if you read such religious literature as the Ten Commandments. Uh, there are certain absolute values. Uh, I'm not uh, a deeply religious uh, person in the sense that I've studied uh, Buddhism or Shinto, but I would understand generally that uh, there's a great deal of relativism involved as opposed to absolutism in the religious traditions in Japan. And that maybe one thing is bad under one set of circumstances, but under another set of circumstances, it's not quite as bad. In that sense, there's a relativism. We would find then that a person who's rooted in one tradition would be shaping and shading everything he says in terms of his own tradition. The person who's raised in another one, another tradition, would also be doing the same thing, and maybe for some incomprehensible reason there would be occasions when they couldn't really understand what the other one was talking about. Uh, there are also uh, areas where any number of factors might uh, enter into a decision, but you have to assign, uh, in terms of your own values, a set of priorities. What is more important? Uh, which is first priority, which is second priority, which is third priority. I think that all of you probably uh, have read enough. Uh, if you do what I do, that is, uh, watch a lot of television in the evening, 
why there's hardly an evening that goes by that I don't see some Western uh, movie, mostly American, but uh, also macaroni Westerns and occasional German movies, Italian movies on Japanese TV. Uh, if you watch enough of these, uh, you get, uh, you know, you get uh, exposed very much to the value system of the other culture. If you see the standard cowboy movie, you begin to understand what the concepts of good and bad are in that wonderful western town out on the prairie where there's just this one very uh, honest, loyal, uh, courageous sheriff and those 15 or 20 outlaws. In the same way, if you watch Japanese historical dramas, after a while you begin to understand what the virtues and the vices are in Japanese society. You begin to understand why this particular bushy is, you know, you know, virtuous and courageous, and why he is a folk hero. Almost by osmosis, you can begin to pick up the differences in the value system. You can find I, I talk of them as differences, but in many cases, uh, what you find is that you're taking different doors to get into the same room. Uh, underlying many of these well, what we would call differences at one level, you find that uh, there are certain common urges, certain common uh, ideals being represented, ideals, you know, in favor of peace, law, order, justice. The means by which you get into this particular ideal room might happen to be different. One door might have a knob and you open it this way, the other door might slide and you open it this way. But uh, there's a difference and yet you end up in the same room. So that, uh, oh dear, I'm not quite sure how much time I have. I think I'm getting right up on the edge of the uh, hour here. This is, do I have uh, one minute? Well, if I have one minute left to summarize, uh, I would first of all, uh, congratulate all of you on deciding to embark on this study. I, I admire people who attempt to expand their minds further, try to reach out and accomplish some worthwhile goal. I would offer you every encouragement to keep going, uh, even though uh, in my own murky fashion I may have spoken in such a way today as to discourage you. Communication can be achieved. Uh, you can go outside after class, get in a taxi, and talk immediately to the stranger who's driving the cab. Uh, you might go home and continue your exercises with the members of your family. You might go back to the office and discover that you're being transferred to the branch in Miami or Marseille or someplace like that. And then you'll really have to... Uh, succeed, that you'll have to really practice what you're only uh, receiving instruction in here today. I thank you all very much for your attention, and uh, I've enjoyed this opportunity to talk to all of you. Best wishes in your studies. Thank you very much.